could be interesting. We'll see. All right, so lesson 62, Jesus entering Jerusalem. Matthew chapter 21 is where we'll start. Okay? It says, And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, and were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway ye shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them, and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught unto you, ye shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and the colt full of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put on them their clothes, and they sat him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. The multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth, of Galilee. So we'll start there. This is beginning the Passion Week, the last week before Jesus' death. He's going to... Enter into Jerusalem, okay, because that is the place where the king symbolically would rule. So he's going to enter as a king, but not as an elected king of the people. And there's many who would want to make an earthly kingdom for him. And there are others who would like to kill him, not even allow him to be a king. Okay. But... He needs to symbolically enter into Jerusalem as its king. Now, think about this. Normally, if a new king was making his triumphal entry into the capital city, how would he do it differently than what Jesus did here? What things would be different? Kenton? Get a great steed, right? Not just a lowly colt full of an ass, but let's get a beautiful grand horse, a great steed, and let's put on it the finest saddle, beautifully decked out and decorated, probably custom made for the king for this day. king would be wearing robes, trumpets would be playing along the road, okay? Now we do see people show respect. They take off their coats and their clothing and lay it on the dusty ground and cut down palm branches and lay those along the way for this colt to then step upon. But there are many other ways. Probably would be a grand procession of all the great leaders and everything else would happen when a king would go in. We think of maybe when the president is inaugurated. They have a parade and he marches down the road, waves to the people. Or any great king who could be put into a position today, we think of maybe in England when Queen Elizabeth dies, her son, the Prince Charles, will become the new king. That will be a grand affair with jewels worth millions of dollars, but we don't see that here with Jesus. We do see a triumphal entry, but the crowds are mixed. Crowds are mixed. Those that hate Jesus and want to kill Him. Those that love Him, desire Him to be their ruler. And those who are in the middle, maybe not one way or the other, maybe they despise Him, maybe they want to make Him an earthly king, But that's what the crowd is like there. And they're speaking there. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. If you take a look in your Bibles. Back to Zechariah 9 verse 9. So just turn there. Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9. 
we read here that the prophecy needed to be fulfilled. Well, what prophecy needed to be fulfilled? Well, if you turn back to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, we see what that prophecy is there. Right before the book of Malachi is Zechariah. What does it say there? Grant, read verse 9 for us here. Alright. So that prophecy comes true here. Okay, that is how the king, at least symbolically in Jesus, will enter the king, our king, the king of God's people, not the king of the Jews because they hate him. They don't want anything to do with him. Okay. Instead, Jesus comes and enters into Jerusalem, we could kind of say in a very similar fashion to the way he was born. How is there a similarity? Between, what is the similarity between Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and Jesus' entry into this world. Both of them were done. How? Jesse? They were humbly done. Very good. Meekness and humility. There wasn't the pomp and the focus of all the world on the birth of Christ, nor was there the pomp and focus on His entry into Jerusalem. Oh, there were heavenly angels and shepherds and wise men who came and honored Christ and sang great praises to Him, just as there are those who line the road and say the beautiful things about Jesus as he goes in. So there are very similar situations here. But again, the rest of the world at Jesus' birth rejected him. Couldn't even find a place for Joseph and Mary to say he had to be born in a stable. And here, as he enters into Jerusalem, they too, the Jews will reject him and not want him as their king. Okay? So, Jesus here comes into Jerusalem and as a king, too, we could say normally, now there already is a ruler in, in Jerusalem. Who is the current ruler of Jerusalem? King what? What's his name? Jennifer? Herod. King Herod. Very good. So if another king was going to come in and enter into the town of Jerusalem, what would happen now with two kings? What must be the next plan of action here? Faith? What do they got to do? Say it a little louder. Vote? vote? Nah, kings don't like votes. Yeah, they like to battle for who will be the ruler. Okay, There will be a battle, but that's not how Jesus comes here. Jesus does not come to battle and to fight against King Herod. He comes in meekly and humbly. His battle will be against Satan and his hosts. Okay, So you see that here. Jesus doesn't come in in that manner either. All right, let us turn then to Mark chapter 11 real quick because we see another bit as Jesus is entering in. If we look back, uh, let's say at verse 9, there you see the same thing, and they went before, and they that followed cried, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Okay. Verse 11, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked round about at all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. So he's gone into Jerusalem. He's made his entry. There are some activities we can probably assume that goes on there. And then he turns around and heads back out that very same night, back to Bethany, to the home of... Whose home will he be going to again? Micah? And... Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So now he goes back out of the city unto Bethany. And on the morrow, when they were come, so this is verse 12, from Bethany, he was hungry, so they're heading once again to Jerusalem. And in the pathway, you can imagine, here's the road, and off in the distance, verse 13, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of the fig was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So he's heading back in 
And he spies the fig tree, thinking, now there, I can produce some food. Now, he knows there's no fruit on that tree, because God knows everything. So it's a teaching point. He goes to that tree as though he were going there looking for food. And there it is, not producing fruit. Leaves are withered on it, not very healthy. What does Jesus do to the tree? He curses it. This is a picture of those who reject Jesus. They bear no fruit. Again, that tree from a far distance may look nice, may look like it's growing. One can see it's a fig tree and would expect it to produce fruit, just like the Pharisees. They look good. We would expect them to produce fruit. But when Jesus goes down to the tree, he finds no fruit on it, and he curses the tree. Same thing that Jesus does to those who hate him, who reject him, or who hijack the name of Christianity and pretend to be Christians. There are many in this world who say that, but then we can see that they aren't. You don't want to stay, Grant? Damon? Okay. Anyways, okay. that's what we see going on here. Okay. The president often claims he's a Christian. But where is he on the Sabbath day? Okay. What does he believe about abortion, divorce, and remarriage? Okay, all those things. Many in this world call themselves Christians. But Jesus here condemns them. Okay? Just like the Jews too. They pretended the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's a barren fig tree. has nothing on it. Okay? And so that's a picture no longer is Israel God's people, but God or Jesus will now go out to the Gentiles. And we'll see that too tomorrow, how he'll go out to the Gentiles. So now he goes back into Jerusalem. So please go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 21. And we see what he does. He went out to Bethany, he comes back on his way and he curses the fig tree. He enters into Jerusalem and now he goes into the city, not in that triumphal entry anymore, but now he goes into the city to visit the temple, his father's house. Verse 12, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. And overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it the den of thieves. Jesus condemns and curses the way that it's being used here. Money changers, selling of doves and animals. Remember, Jesus had to cleanse the temple a long time ago, the beginning of his ministry. Started stirring up the Jews. And well, now you can imagine once more he angers and frustrates the Jews. They're looking for anything they can do to kill him. And so, tells him, ye have made it a den of thieves. Probably dishonest traitors here. Those looking to gain for their own advantage. And Jesus is not happy. Okay. Now, Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 16. Turn in your Bibles there. What did Jesus prophesy that in 3 days he would de- or he would destroy it and then in 3 days build again? What did he prophesy a long time ago that the people mocked him about Kenton? The temple. There that temple was speaking of his body. Okay? He would die, be destroyed, hung on the cross, and in three days he would raise up. So that temple now that he's referring to is the temple. First, physically here, you've made my father's house a den of thieves, and Jesus has to cleanse the temple. But also, in three days he will be cleansing the body of Christ, the body of believers, our sins will be cleansed and wiped away from us. That also will happen. But now you have a physical earthly body as well, and you belong to Christ. 
The body that you have is a gift given from God for you to take care of. No different than the school building. No different than your home. Different than the church building. And all your objects of, and possessions that you may have. There is a difference. God has given your body a soul. Okay? But it is something that God has given to you to care for. And He has cleansed it. He's made it new. We don't want to do anything to ruin it or destroy it. Reverend Geichler had the great sermon a few months ago about that, taking care of our bodies as a temple. We don't want to destroy it. We don't want to do anything that would mar this body. And so that's why I had you turn here to 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Okay. Your body is the temple of God. Jesus had to cleanse that temple, our bodies, of sin. And now they're clean and whole. We shouldn't do anything to mar our bodies or destroy them or ruin them in a way that's unpleasing to God. So, then we see there, oops, if I go back, I can go back to chapter 21. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying in the temple, singing, crying out with praises and joy, and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. And he said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Ye, yea, have ye never read out of the mouths of babes and sucklings? Thou hast perfected praise. Look at what you're doing, the, the priests and Pharisees say to Jesus. You're, you're ruining the minds of these children in their, in their eyes. And Jesus says, no. No, what's coming from their mouth is a beautiful thing. And that's why we've seen before how Jesus says, great is the faith of a child. We should all be as children and have faith as they do to be able to praise and glorify him. Hosanna to the son of David. And that upset the leaders. And we'll see how they continue okay, to destroy. So even these children encourage Jesus in his work. And Jesus is pleased to have children brought to him. Why we would not agree with the Baptists. We say we must wait for children to be brought to Jesus. We cannot baptize them until they're older. No, no Jesus delights every time a covenant child is born in the church. We soon will have more. And we see baptism. What a beautiful thing that these children, just like little Samuel being brought to the tabernacle, to Eli being sacrificed and given to God's soul. Beautiful thing that happens at baptism. You all were brought. I was brought. Our parents dedicated us in our lives and all that they promised to do to give us instruction, correction, whatever is needed so that we will glorify God as we're commanded to do. And there's nothing that would give them more joy than to see you doing that. So you've had that at baptism. Hope you look forward to, and don't wait too long to make confession of faith. Nothing wrong with being in high school or a year or two out. Don't wait until you're 25, 30, 40. But once you know and are convinced and believe that what is taught and the church is the truth. Make that confession. That's a beautiful thing that brings great joy to Jesus and all that He has done for you and for me.